to His Excellency Mr. Petros Solomon, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Eritrea. Mr. Solomon has the floor. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished delegates, <clears throat> at the outset, I wish to seize this opportunity to congratulate you, Mr. President, upon your election as the President of the 49th Session of the General Assembly of the United Nations. I am confident that you will guide our deliberations with wisdom and skill. Permit me also to rejoice with the people of South Africa who have at long last eradicated apartheid and created a plural society in which all the citizens of South Africa, irrespective of their ethnic, religious, or class backgrounds, shall live in harmony, freedom, and equality. Their victory is a victory of good over evil and a tribute to the concept of unity in diversity as well as a unique example of the concerted, unremitting, and successful struggle of humanity against a pernicious assault on human dignity and nobility. We are also happy to note that in the Middle East, age-old adversaries have come close enough to resolve some of the most intractable problems of our time by negotiations based on understanding and the accommodations of the interests of all parties. We welcome the agreements reached between Israel and the PLO, as well as the subsequent agreements reached between Israel and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. We hope that this initial move, whose momentum must be maintained, will augur well for a comprehensive, permanent, and enduring peace in the region as a whole. Mr. President, we have now entered a new era of renewed hope. As the United Nations approaches its golden jubilee, it has become increasingly evident that the majority of the nations and peoples of the world believe in the essentiality of the world organization and are reposing on its renewed hope and confidence. In the aftermath of the Cold War, we are witnessing a transition towards a new pattern of international relations. And in the uncertainty of the historical process, which is establishing a new world order, the United Nations has once again become the eminently relevant, perhaps even the indispensable organization that its founding fathers had wished it to be. The emerging new international system and the universality of its membership, as well as the abundant goodwill it has garnered, offer the United Nations the unique opportunity not only to establish new guidelines to address international challenges, but to ensure that the coming new world will be permeated by the values of collective security, peace, democracy, social justice, and cooperation for mutual benefit. This is also a favorable time for the United Nations to raise global awareness, fashion a common world outlook, probe new frontiers and create new standards, particularly in the realms of sustainable and equitable global development, conflict prevention, management and resolution, human and democratic rights, and social justice. These great tasks will, my delegation is convinced, inevitably require commensurate changes in the structure and functional modalities of the United Nations system itself, if it is to cope with the challenges of the new international order. The institutions and agencies which reflected the exigencies of the last half century must be modified 
or yield to new ones which mirror not only the optimism and needs of the present, but also the hopes and aspirations of the future. The international system must turn obviously in a gradual and measured pace towards a fairer and more equitable representation of its constituencies in all the organs of the system and especially in the Security Council. This may indeed be the most opportune time to review structural issues with new vision and boldness, the ultimate purpose being to instill and build in the system a dynamism which would enable it to respond and adjust in time to changing global realities. Furthermore, we feel that the UN must make significant emphasis on the emplacement of a reliable early warning system which would enable it to avert disasters and conflicts. An active rather than a reactive role by the UN can go a long way to reduce, if not prevent, human suffering and to mitigate disasters and conflicts at a lesser cost to the international community. Secondly, all available evidence on the structure of the United Nations emphasizes the need to restructure on the basis of equilibrium between the forces of centralization and decentralization. Certain problems, such as the environment, population, and disarmament, may necessitate coordinated international action and centralized authority. Others, including the breakdown of political systems and regional interstate conflicts, may be better and more correctly understood and solved by regional actors, institutions, and approaches. There is thus an imperative to set in motion a dynamic arrangement balancing centralization and decentralization to create the desired judicial basis for a new world order underlined by a political culture of peace, justice, economic well-being, and a healthy environment. This catalytic role should be the major preoccupation of the United Nations. Only such an environment can make it an effective actor which protects and promotes peace, development, and human rights. Mr. President, the situation in the Horn of Africa is far from satisfactory, although it may be improving by the day. I must perhaps emphasize here that the impoverishment that stocks the region as a whole is largely man-made and cannot be attributed to the visits of nature, as it is often made out to be. Decades of war and civil strife have sapped the energy, productive capacity, and coping mechanisms of the populations, leaving them easily susceptible to even minor imbalances in rainfall patterns and natural calamities. Hence, international emergency assistance, and much more so development assistance, will remain vital for years to come in remedying the consequences of decades of war and turmoil. We in the government of Eritrea, along with our regional partners, realize that reliable and sustainable economic development will lie in effective regional cooperation hinging on durable peace and stability. It is in this spirit that we and our partners are prepared to pool our resources to secure regional peace through mechanisms of close consultation and coordination for conflict prevention and resolution and by broadening areas of economic interaction and cooperation. It's against this backdrop and within the framework of a regional approach that we have attempted to address the quest for collective security in our region. In Somalia, the countries of the region under the chairmanship of President Melas Zenawi of Ethiopia, had done much to restore normalcy to the country by bringing the war in factions to the negotiating table. This regional effort has complemented and acted as a vital linkage to international intervention at crucial crossroads. In this connection, 
We believe that this is an auspicious moment for the UN to focus in the period ahead only on the provision of assistance to the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the devastated country. The opinion advanced by some in the last few days that the extension of UNISOM's mandate will be vital for and enhance political reconciliation is, we are convinced, a seriously flawed conjecture. Indeed, all evidence from the country indicates that such an action is likely to complicate or delay the process. On the other hand, the International Governmental Authority on Drought and Development, IGAD, should take upon itself and be encouraged to continue the political reconciliation that it has facilitated in the past. In the Sudan too, the countries of the region have applied the same regional approach and had proposed different framework of conflict resolution to facilitate a comprehensive political settlement which takes into account the best interests and welfare of both sides. Here too, the international community should encourage and support the regional efforts undertaken under the auspices of IGAD. Mr. President, some of the major problems that have existed for some years are still with us, and indeed new ones have been added. Thus, the crisis in ex-Yugoslavia does not appear to be nearer to a solution than it was before. The events in Rwanda are a tragic reminder of human folly and have etched an indelible mark on the collective conscience of humanity. These events no doubt reinforce the necessity of preventive measures and perhaps the need to make a fresh assessment of the conventional limitations of the UN in peacekeeping. I thank you. <clears throat> I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Eritrea. We have heard the last speaker in the general debate for this meeting. The meeting is adjourned. That's it. Very much. Thank you very thank much. You. <laughs>